Hello, everybody. This is Tosca at NGO Soul and Strategy. Today, I am talking about a topic that is new for my series of podcast episodes, and that is the topic of governance as it relates to ethics and integrity, or ethics and integrity as it relates to, to governance. I'm excited uh, that this will be the first uh, episode in a, in a new series on, uh, on the topic of governance. And for that, I couldn't have found a better interviewee than Alex Cole Hamilton, who is an expert on ethics integrity uh, in the INGO sector. And so, Alex, welcome to our podcast. Well, thank you for having me. You're so welcome. So let me tell our audience in a moment or for, for right now a little bit about your background. Alex, you are an independent consultant, as am I. You advise boards and executives on ethics and integrity risks and related uh, decision-making frameworks. I understand you uh, were the head of ethics and compliance at Oxfam Great Britain, is that right? Yeah. yeah. And also the former head of corporate responsibility at Oxfam Great Britain. And interestingly enough for me, um, you are a former ethical trade project manager at The Body Shop. And that's just interesting to me because mm -hmm. I, even as a young woman, have been buying uh, their, their stuff so for about uh, two, two decades on and off. So Alex, as I said, welcome. This episode, as I said, fits in a new series that I'm starting on governance. Now you, in preparing for us, in preparing for this interview, you did put some caveats around the fit of your area of work by describing it in, uh, in the following, and I, here I'm paraphrasing you. I'm an ethics and integrity practitioner rather than a governance expert. I have worked with boards and I talked to a number of trustees since leaving Oxfam. Uh, this has definitely informed my thinking on power as it relates to governance, but I can't speak from a board perspective uh, since I'm, my own involvement in governing on a board is fairly recent. So we're fully acknowledging that. So tell us what is your area of, of knowledge and of practice? Uh, unpack that a little bit, ethics and integrity. So, um, so uh, thank you for the intro. And um, yeah, I think I am quite new to the governance area. Um, I thought I, it's probably easiest if I sort of tell the kind of the, the story of how I got into ethics and integrity. So I started actually working um, in South Africa on microcredit, really interested in gender and development, and then went to UNICEF at the regional office in South Asia and um, worked on gender-based violence, addressing gender-based violence, and then did my master's in gender and development and at the Institute of Development Studies. And that's where I really got introduced to the, the concept of power. So this was back in early 2000. And it was interesting because at that time I, I realized that, or I felt quite uncomfortable working in the INGO sector. It felt, uh, felt quite colonial. I didn't like the power dynamics and, um, so I actually, I actually decided to go and, and see what could be done in the private sector to address human rights. And this was when it was all just really starting and, and the body shop was a bit ahead of other organizations at that time. Yeah. And so I went to the body yeah. shop. And, um, and while I was at the body shop, um, Oxfam had a scandal, 2006. So I don't know if you remember this one, but yeah. essentially they had made poverty history wristbands made. Right. And they were made in a factory in China with forced labor. And Oxfam had done very basic checks. So I, so Oxfam created a role that was looking at labor rights in its supply chains. And so I thought, you know, that is a comfortable space within an INGO for me. That's looking at its ethics. So I moved over. And over the years, the role grew and it was environment and human rights, looking at mainly Oxfam's supply chains. And what I realized was in that role was there were other ethical decisions being made in, in other parts of the organization that were um, that that I felt linked, but at the time were managed completely separately. So who should the corporate partners be? Um, what should the investment strategy be for pensions? You know, should there be a living wage for yeah. for staff members? All those kinds of questions. And so um, 
and and there was a tension as well because at the time ethics and integrity was um was not really something that was addressed um uh, within the ingo sector because the assumption was that everyone needed to be focused on the mission and there wasn't a lot of headspace to go beyond that so so i worked to bring together the different issues under one coherent framework um so you know if you think of all the different integrity issues of human rights and environment and then all the different aspects that they apply to so um corporate partnerships and supply chains things like that and but the one area that was separate was um was misconduct so how people behaved and um and then after the safeguarding crisis i took on that piece to drive coherence with that and then as i left we brought together the operational um how the organization behaves corporate responsibility how individuals behave the misconduct piece and risk and assurance and that was all thrown together as one division and what i learned from that was that good governance really enabled that to to happen so i took those lessons and and then wanted to go independent and work with more organizations so yeah so that's maybe a bit of a of a longer answer in terms of but it just gives you the journey of how it evolved the, yeah, you know, in yeah of... interesting so let's just pause for a moment um before we come with some more example areas because i really would like to make this very um uh uh, uh what's the right word not tactical but tactile for our our yeah. audience so you you mentioned these three categories that you basically um came up with in the oxford work the organizational the individual, so organizational behavior, individual behavior, and then risk assessment. Did I get that right? Or risk assurance? It was well, it was more that there was yeah, pretty much, but essentially until the safeguarding crisis, I'd worked on organizational behavior. So if we think about what is an organization's responsibility for the negative impacts it could have. So that's environmental impact, social impact, uh, investments, that kind of stuff. Then so that was one piece. And then after the safeguarding crisis, we drove coherence on approaches to misconduct. So individual behavior. So how does the organization define how an individual should behave and how does the organization support that through culture, whistleblowing, all of that. And then separate to that was a third department, which was risk and assurance, which was integrating systems of risk into operations. And uh, those three, so I, I was I was not um, leading on that piece, that was a separate piece, but those three needed to come together or were brought together to create a new division so that you looked at both organizational individual behavior and then you integrated it in the organization's approach to risk. So risk really, is defined differently in the sense that risk historically has been risk to the mission, risk to the organization. Mm -hmm. And now risk is also risk of harm, you know, right. externally and internally. Right. Risk of harm. So, I, I may come back to you on, on that mm -hmm. uh, if we have the time. Um, but before we go deeper, talk to me about a couple of example areas. So you have this nice, um, uh, banner at the top of your LinkedIn in in um, uh, profile, which we'll we'll link to in the, the the show notes, and it gives some of these nice example areas. Mention some so that our listeners can really become very concrete about what, what kind of areas an NGO needs to think about. So it kind of when I think of inte organizational integrity, I, I sort of break it into two two parts in my mind. So the first part is the issues. So, um, so I think of integrity issues as where an organization or its individuals can cause harm and where it has a responsibility to act well. So that would be safeguarding, anti-corruption, environmental impact, modern slavery, diversity and inclusion, pay gaps, uh, decolonization, legitimacy, all of those issues, right? So if we think of those issues, which interconnect and dovetail, mm. but interestingly, have often evolved in different parts of the organization. And I can go into that fragmented bit in a minute. So that's one piece. Then the other pieces is where they apply, right? So, so you've got individual behavior and misconduct, sort of one area, then you've got uh, culture, then leadership, and mission or purpose and then you've got supply chains and all the issues there and corporate partnerships um you know who do you partner with and where can you share brands for example 
pensions and investments, uh, wages for staff. Um, oh, I'm, uh, there's, there's others, but <laughs> I can't. Anyway, if you think of just all the activities that an organization has. Um, so if you've got the, the issues in one, on one hand and then the activities in the other, the issues apply to multiple activities. Yes. And, um, and the issues also interconnect. So it's organizational integrity for me is about understanding how they interconnect and taking a system wide approach that um, that's more coherent and actually feels more manageable. I think a lot of organizations are feeling really overwhelmed at the moment with the number of issues that they're dealing with. And they're also, you know, the question I often get is, well, what's the next issue? How can I be on the front foot? Yeah. And this, this holistic approach really helps find the issues that are falling between the cracks. Well, you're you're getting into uh, my next question. So let's go there. But I love what you just did again. Love those earlier categories. I love this, what you just said between issues and activities and how you impact it. It's both makes it very concrete and also helps the, uh, the listener kind of analyze it themselves. Um, so you've been developing an approach um, since you uh, became an independent consultant, but in collaboration with others. And I, I imagine you, you'll, you'll mention a little bit about the collaborative group that you're working with and the charity commission in the UK, which is not, you know, something that's familiar to all of our listeners because we have listeners from all over the world, right? Um, but you've developed this approach or you are developing this approach to address ethics and integrity through governance and through focusing squarely on power. What's wrong with the current approach to ethics and integrity in NGOs, in addition to what you've already used the word coherence a couple of times and that organizations are overwhelmed, et cetera, and, 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 um, and that, that the value of coherence, but what is more broadly wrong or limited about how NGOs go about integrity and, uh, and ethics that made you want to connect it to governance and explicitly using power analysis as the lens. So I think that um, ethics and integrity is actually quite young in the INGO sector. Mm. Um, so just sort of going back to my, my comments before when I was developing this approach to I called it corporate responsibility at the time, sort of 2016. So that was looking at the organization's impacts, right? It was before misconduct was brought in as well because that was managed elsewhere. So when looking at the, the organization's behavior, you know, I'll give you an example of like um, environmental impact. So Oxfam was um, campaigning on, um, on climate change, you know, and its impact on, on people in poverty. And also it had, um, a huge network of shops so which used a lot of energy and there was a question around okay so if if oxfam is having to deliver programs to help people adapt to climate change on 80p to the pound it only has 20p for overheads and being responsible and just is it acceptable you, sorry one second there, alex just for our, our our listeners when you use the word p i think you're talking about uh, pens to oh pens yes so a unit of a pen yeah, 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 yeah. So, but we could, we, we could, you know, it's ratio. So we could say um, eighty cents to the dollar. You know, sort of as a similar, uh, and um, and so if you're having to deliver overheads and responsibility on that twenty cents or pence, then um, then it's very difficult to invest in the right kind of equipment to reduce the carbon footprint in those shops. Mm -hmm. So you have to make a decision about whether you redirect money for program into being responsible. And when you've got a governing body whose primary objective is to deliver on the mission, and you've got senior managers who are being measured on delivering on the mission, it is a very difficult place to put them in yeah. to have to then make that call, right? That's yeah. really, really hard. A real so what happens is it's, it's very difficult. And so what you've got is, um, and so what often happens is the mission trumps because oh, I hate that word but the mission is is what has to until there's a steer a senior steer about actually having it's it's acceptable to redirect funds then the mission has to has to come first which um which is understandable but then you have issues of irresponsibility so there's questions around how responsible and how much do you redirect these are really really difficult decisions that need to be thought about so environment is only one aspect of 
organizational integrity, right? So if we think then about all the other aspects, they've generally evolved in the area where they were a primary concern initially or understood to be a primary concern. So decisions around how they sit with the mission have often been taken by different senior management teams, different clusters of subcommittees at executive level and at trustee level. So what you get is a fragmented understanding of the organization's impact at a trustee level. Mm -hmm. Because you've got, so for example, anti-corruption will often escalate up to um, a risk and finance subcommittee at trustee level. And safeguarding will escalate up to a culture and people subcommittee. Yeah. But actually, they're both about abuse of power. Mm -hmm. And often it can be the same person doing both. But if you've got an, an anti-corruption team reporting to one subcommittee and a safeguarding team reporting to another, their approaches and investigations aren't going to be joined up and they're not going to see that they that actually they would benefit from being more mm -hmm. coherent mm -hmm. so what i'm seeing when i i did a you know i've been working with quite a wide group of, of ingos and what i'm seeing is the trend is still to be quite fragmented and that's that's generally because the program's quite young you know it's grown in all these different parts yeah yeah and the best way to move it forward now is to get a really clear understanding and steer at a senior level to support these senior managers with these difficult decisions yeah yeah, yeah. got it so that that's forgotten. Go, sorry. i've forgotten the second part of your question <laughs> let's, let's go there now it's all right so um you explained again why, what's the problem with the fragmented uh, approach. So, and you went to, you said, you know, you needed that steer from senior part of the government that says it's okay to redirect some money from the mission and from programming to the uh, coherent approach towards managing uh, risk and um, managing ethics and, and integrity. Is that why? governance became important to you and why is uh, power analysis mm. I could see how that could be a cross-cutting approach and maybe that is the attraction right mm. so tell tell us more about those two elements so I think I'll start with power and then I'll come back to why governance I think that's the order that would work so so there's so much fabulous work that's been done on power and I've loved your previous podcast with various people that you've been interviewing and talking about all the work and understanding that's been done on yeah. power so you know as I said my I was introduced to it when I was at IDS or the Institute of Development Studies back in early 2000s and it's evolved a lot since then yeah. um, I've been looking at the work of uh, Aruna Rao with Gender at Work and John Gaventa with the Power Cube uh, Shri, Shri Lata Bhattavali, you know, with feminist leadership and, and really informing my thinking on, on all that fabulous work. And, and essentially, you know, if I think about my, my um, journey of understanding how power links to integrity, it, um, it initially was when I was doing driving coherence with misconduct. So recognizing that misconduct is generally about abuse of power, right? Sexual mm -hmm. abuse, anti-corruption, not all anti-corruption, but quite a lot of anti-corruption, bullying. And that actually the there are what what became clear was we could we could address systems and the culture within the organization, but actually the organization is shaped by much deeper power structures that exist within society. Mm -hmm. So I think that, and so then when we start taking that lens, then we start seeing that other ways that those deep power structures manifest in the organization need to be addressed, how they link with the issues of misconduct. So, for example, you know, um, deep structures of inequality, so race, gender, um, will, uh, will, will manifest in an organization by lack of diversity at leadership or, um, or lack of understanding that or viewing leadership roles as being able to be flexible or supporting men to take on part-time roles so that they can share caring responsibilities, for example, in senior roles. So if an organization, so by those deep structures manifesting in those ways in the organization, you start seeing that actually the, the um, strategy that the organization has about diversity and inclusion, leadership, culture, modern slavery, which is impacted by the same deep structures, they're all linked. And actually you need to take a systems approach 
to all of them to really address any of the issues well. Mm. And actually by using power as the lens to enable an organization to see how all the different issues link means that you can then start seeing where negative impacts are that you might have been blind to. Mm, okay. So it, uh, and it also enables um, senior management and executive and trustees to see the risks of harm beside each other, what the underlying drivers are, and then prioritize accordingly and steer. This is the area we're really going to focus on. Whereas at the moment, I feel a lot of the issues are escalating to trustee level who are feeling quite overwhelmed because they're not being connected. Yeah. So, so that's really why power, I think, is and and I and just just to build on that a bit more. So when I think of integrity issues, and I'm really trying to shift the narrative from ethics to integrity, is you know, if we think about what integrity means it, it's got two meanings it means um like honest and values based and principled but it also means whole whole system and the danger i've seen certainly in the private sector and in some parts in the ngo sector is that business ethics or corporate responsibility or social environmental impact is sits on the side you know it's a nice to have or it's integrated where it's appropriate or convenient or or the business case works with it you know mm -hmm. as opposed to seeing it as actually interconnected with the whole and needing to be addressed as the or as part of the organization strategically you know like how what so so then you know if i take a power lens my thinking is what is the organ the organization needs to be honest about where power sits, how it is used, how it interacts with power structures and manifests external power structures. And then by being accountable to those people with less power, define what responsible and accountable and positive use of power by the organization and its individuals looks like. Mm. And to me, that would be organizational integrity. And if you can get that clarity, I'm not saying that the trustees define it, because I don't think they're necessarily the right people to define it. You need to bring in the right people. But, but once that's agreed and accepted at a trustee level, then you can start getting steer, you know, in terms of where to priorities and, and also for them to understand where the most serious impacts are. Yeah, so let me, um, let me just for the sake of, of, of uh, the, the argument and um, let, let's test these two ideas a little bit more. So. Um, first of all, so the power analysis, what might be the limits of, of having a, a, a power lens? A particularly, um, I mean, can, my first question to you is, can boards even develop a muscle to do this in an honest way? And how do they look upon their own power? Yeah, it's like such a good question. So I think that, um, I think that, this isn't about the board's leading on integrity uh, for the, well, sorry, that that's not, <laughs> I don't think that's quite the right thing what I said, but this isn't about the boards doing the work. It's about, I feel there's three things that boards need. So the first is, um, it's about understanding that integrity issues are connected. So, um, and and viewing them and prioritizing in that way. The second, I think, is about having a common framework and language for power. Mm -hmm. What I think is what I have found really interesting over the past year talking to trustees and boards and executives is that there's a very good understanding of power analysis within a lot of INGOs that are doing programming campaigning. It is what is used to talk about inequality. Yeah. But there's a real lack of understanding and a discomfort at trustee level. Which talking is very about ironic, power. as you said. Which is ironic. Well, yeah, yeah. So, so I think. And I, and I can understand it's it's quite a it's what overpowering concept like it it you know it, by having a common framework and common language and also being and just saying you know we just need to be honest about where power sits exactly. and and clear about what responsible and positive use of power is then that that underpins a lot of their decisions and can can speak to issues they're looking at like decolonization the really big structural stuff as well as internal culture as well as how they you know how responsible do they feel in terms of how they invest money in their pensions you know there's they don't need to apply power analysis in depth to 
investment strategies, but more have an overarching agreement that we feel we have a responsibility for these five issues and we want them to reflect in these ways across the different ways we impact the world, one of which is investment. Um, so sorry, for trustees, I feel it's common language on power, common understanding of integrity. And the third is the, the right questions to help them oversee and support the organization to think in a about this in a holistic way. And then I feel a lot of support needs to happen at exec and senior management level to actually then work through those questions and rethinking. But my hope is that this will actually, while it feels very big and the feedback I'm having when you ask about the limitations is this approach feels big um, and it is a real step back. But I think that this is about moving from patchwork to coherence, from reactive to proactive. You know, so the big step back is, is big, but it should make things feel more manageable. And I think there's a few years that's really tough as you start working through it, but then it starts to become clearer, you know, so it, it's not an easy path, I don't think, but it will help. Eventually, yeah, yeah. It, and that that makes uh, very good, good sense to me. You know, one of the, the, the things I was asking myself is, you know, so often you will hear senior leaders say, well, our boards really, um, they're so hands off, they, they have, so, they have so little time or they spend so little time on their governing responsibility that uh, we really don't get a lot of value from their strategy, their attempts to give strategic guidance. And so this is one more thing where these boards need to develop a, an understanding around, right? Um, and and then ask the right questions and oversee that that the answers are actually provided and are executed upon. So that, that was one of the, 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 the kind of um, nuances that um, that I wanted to to bring, but I did do see your point. You said it feels big, and it is a new area of investing in understanding and an application, as you said. But you're saying in the medium term that can really have important um, payoffs, if you will, in terms of that coherence mm -hmm. and and consistency of of, of approach. Now. Um, Maybe one more thing before we go to the uh, towards the end of our time together. Um, you know, I find NGOs can be quite inward oriented as it is. There's a lot of navel gazing, and the larger the organization, the more internal focus there is, and uh, and transaction costs that come with that, etc. Right and. God knows I've known plenty of people in Oxfam who told me that they spend well over 90% of their time internally and not focused on the external world, what's changing in the external world, what we need to affect in the external world, how we need to collaborate with not just like-minded, but also unlike-minded characters, actors, if you will, in order to have more impact. To what extent does this, um, enhanced focus on integrity and all these dimensions of ethics and integrity that you mentioned in the beginning of our interview, does it further reinforce this internal orientation? Is there anything there to critique it or am I, I I'm just trying to draw you out. Yeah, yeah, I think that, um, I mean, this approach to ethics and integrity is really about shifting the thinking of risk from the risk to the mission and the risks to the organization to the risk of harm internally and externally. and to look at power dynamics internally and externally, but understand how greater structural dynamics that are external manifest internally. And that could be the strategy, that could be the current, um, you know, that could be the work on decolonization. So thinking about how the sector works. Um, so I feel it, it actually broadens the perspective of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of, um, from my experience, when when we put together um, a structure of, uh, you know, the governance levels, governance at the right, all the different levels, so senior management, executive, and then trustee, um, it started to actually give confidence to to people that the right people were involved in making the decisions, and there was coherence with decisions. So there is actually less internal quest questioning on some aspects. I mean, this was all very much evolving, right? But um, but it started to build a feeling of confidence that that the right decision makers were around the table, that the right perspectives were being brought in, or that that would, and so hmm. people could actually there was less um, swirl. It's interesting. 
there was a there, yeah there was less yeah I'm just trying to think about what the what the 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 um, way of describing it is but when I first stepped into the role I was just constantly getting emails from lots of members of staff who were upset with many decisions that were made and after one year I found that that had reduced considerably because we were communicating how we were making decisions. We had a coherent structure. People knew unions were being asked questions around wages. You know, we were really sharing how we were going about it and how the issues were linking. And, and I found that those, that discomfort was reducing, mm. you know, and so that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly interesting. And, and that means then that people feel they have, more time to spend on on the outside world, on the mission, on programming, but also on how to, um, uh, yeah, to keep that eye on the um, on uh, on the dance floor, as somebody says, um, yeah. in 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 uh, adaptive leadership models. All right, uh, Alex. So let me ask you towards the end now of our time together a couple of kind of impromptu questions that are that are meant to be answered spontaneously, right? So um, here comes the first one. What I wish I would have done differently in my previous work on ethics and integrity is dot, dot, dot. Take your time. Hmm. Um. <laughs> um, I think I would have liked to have earlier understood the links with all the work on misconduct. Um, I was very focused on just the organization. I mean, that was being managed somewhere else. Um, I think I I think I would have liked to have, and this is something I want to explore now, also share more between the private and the INGO sector on, on like some honest conversations on how organizational integrity works. I think that there's, that in a lot of ways, the, the private sector, has had to um, professionalize and systematize a lot of this. I'm not saying that they've got it all right. There's definitely some some concerns and 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 gaps, which you know they're very honest about, uh, quite honest about. But but I think there they are there are some really helpful lessons that they have on board oversight and an integrated approach. And I think I would have I wish I'd tapped into that a bit sooner rather than learning it as I went. Yeah, and the interesting thing, of course, another irony, and I wish we had time to talk about some of these ironies some more, is that, of course, the NGO sector is often amongst the first to critique the private sector for its lack of uh, ethics and integrity, as well as many other things. But it's not the first yeah. time where we're actually caught ourselves kind of flat footed yeah. uh, in the very things that we uh, criticize uh, others for. Okay, one more uh, of these open ended questions. In your area of work, um, what would help, here's the question, what would help our sector the most right now is dot, dot, dot. Donors understanding the cost of integrity and building it into uh, funding strategies. Mm, I love it. Mm. On the donors understanding the cost of integrity and, and building it in just like some donors, at least foundations, are now more um, realistic about and uh, about the real costs of, of um, yeah. pulling off. It's um, evolving, but I think I think we need a bigger step. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to suggest that it, it's not happening, but it's it's evolving and needs to evolve further, I feel. Yeah. 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 Super. This has been terrific. Um, where should people go if they want to learn more about you, Alex, you and your work and the work with others that you're doing at the moment? Tell us a little bit more about that collaborative work and where people should go for you to find you. Oh, brilliant. No, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm working with um, five fantastic people who are helping build um, an approach and a model to support organizations um, on this holistic approach. And um, and I just want to add in a, um, I just want to uh, correct something. Um, we're, we're working um, to respond to a question from the charity, the UK Charity Governance Code Steering Group, not the Charity Commission. Just uh, wanted I'm to clarify. Wrong about that. I'm sorry. No, no, no. But uh, so we influenced the inclusion of power, organizational and individual power in the UK Charity Governance Code, which all charities are asked to follow. And, um, and the Charity Governance Code um, 
responded to our request, which was great, but then they said, so how should we support organizations to do this? So I've been working with five people and we're all sort of just putting our time in right now to figure out, well, what could this look like? Because we really, you know, our, our hope is to, is to provide something really useful that can that can be applied across the sector. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a website coming up, but uh, it'll be another month or so. So I will share the link with you once I have that. But in the meantime, if people want to get in touch, I'm so interested to hear from people on their views about this. We're hoping to create a community of practice so that probably the easiest way to connect at the moment is via my website, mm -hmm. um, which is alexcolehamilton.com. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've a link in your um i will turn yeah. yes and um and then um and or my linkedin page yeah or your linkedin page but really okay. invite people to get in touch if they've got thoughts or if any of this resonates because we're yeah we are developing a community of practice hopefully and we are wanting to test the work super i i think i would encourage you when the work uh has evolved to a point where you feel uh comfortable with it maybe also uh, propose that uh for uh, ngo members and leaders here in the us maybe in the interaction context you might uh, want to do a, a presentation on this body of work. Oh, i think yeah. it's more worth yeah. other people's attention so Thank you very much, Alex, for your insights. It's been wonderful. The, the, the field of ethics and integrity is not something that I know a lot about, and I, I learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners do too. Next up, listeners, um, just to let you know, I will do an, uh, uh, release an interview with Srilata Bhatliwala. It's funny that you mention her, um, Alex the well-known Indian social movement scholar and practitioner, and as some people call her, the grandmother of feminist leadership. Um, if you found this podcast uh, stimulating, then please help other social sector leaders by, by finding the podcast, by leaving, a, by leaving a review. If you're interested in um, kind of sector level developments, um, my uh, co-authors and myself have a book called Between Power and Irrelevance, The Future of Transnational NGO that came out last year that might be of interest to you. And I've also started uh, a new YouTube channel where I am um, uploading videos of the most recent set of podcast episodes and have some other uh, third party content. Uh, that you might find of interest. Any and all of this you can find on my website, fiveoaksconsulting.org. This is Tosca, and I look forward to uh, spending time with you in NGO Soul and Strategy.